Yes. Hello, everybody. Yay. Other seats towards the front. Uh, if you don't know thing uh, where things are, there's bathrooms are right next to the like door. the door. Like if you go out. Yeah. Out uh, of the office. I think they're on both sides. There's drinks towards the back, and then in the in the the what how do you call them? Fridge. The fridge towards your left. Uh, should be food. Um, yeah. Well, welcome to our first Papers We Love of 2018. Yay! Year three, year four? Oh, uh, yeah, four, let's say four. I think so, yeah. Uh, we're pretty excited. It's, it's going to be a fun year. We have a lot of great people and talks. Yeah, go ahead. Am I? You're supposed to be no, talking. I'm sorry. Yes. Still, still posing, still talking. Yeah. Okay. We have some great talks planned this year. We also still have open slots. If you have a cool topic in mind and, and want to do something with us this year, we're looking for more um, lesser known uh, papers, papers and topics. topics. Yeah. Uh, we want to do more around HCI and AI and other kind of weird stuff that you all are interested in. Yeah. We also did a feedback form at the end of last year. So we're going to be looking into that a little bit more and taking ideas from that. If you haven't filled that out, we can still pass it around. Yeah, we should, um, we should, we should. If you're not in our Slack, let me and Inez know and we'll add you. Or if not, just we tweet things. Too. Yeah. All right. So let's get started. Uh, if you're new, uh, the way this works, we have a we have a mini. Uh, we introduce the mini speaker. Uh, we tell something that is true, something that is a lie. And then uh, we have a main talk where we do exactly the same. We say something true about the person and then something that is a complete lie and fabrication. So let's get started. Welcome, Peter. His name is Peter Bergen. Peter is a distributed systems engineer who has seen things. He's the author of GoKit, a toolkit for microservices, and OKLog, a distributed login system. He's currently driving the engineering observability initiative within Fastly. In his spare time, Peter holds a silver medal in competitive duck herding. Let's give it up for Peter. Hello. Does this work? Yes. Hi. Uh, so today I'm going to give a short talk about uh, Cas Paxos, which I guess is how you pronounce that, which is a uh, a new paper that I read uh, very recently. And if someone, maybe someone over here, can give me like a 18 minute warning or something, so I don't blow past. No. Okay. Sure. Cool. Uh, okay. So um, Cas Paxos is uh, a paper dealing with the world of data systems. So let's contextualize just a tiny bit. So we're all talking about the same thing. Um, data systems, maybe databases, but I like to generalize a bit more than that. Uh, they, they exist, individual systems exist at points in a variety of spectrums. And I think one interesting spectrum that we're all probably familiar with is the spectrum between relational and non-relational data systems. So relational being the uh, typical Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, this sort of thing, uh, RDBMS systems, relational database management systems. And on the other end of things is so-called non-relational systems, NoSQL, Mongo, uh, Cassandra, perhaps. So this, this is one spectrum that uh, products and, and, and systems can exist on. Another spectrum, which is uh, increasingly relevant, at least to the work that I do, is the spectrum between strongly consistent and weakly or eventually consistent systems. And this is the C and the A and the CAP theorem. And as we hopefully all know, you have to choose P. So this is where the spectrum lies between uh, C and A. So today we're talking about a protocol that applies to strongly consistent, uh, non-relational asterisk systems. And I put the asterisk there because uh, very frequently now people are building relational layers on top of non-relational systems. Uh, Spanner in Google is like uh, one system that I think is the, the, the nexus or the origin of a lot of these systems. CockroachDB is another one that's coming up. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a number of them that are, are built in this way. So star. Um, so here's, here's the paper, uh, Caspexus replicated state machines without logs. And look at how fresh this is. This was released like a, a week ago, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this means I don't really have a lot of experience with it. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, but this is interesting, I think. Um, so a week ago was 2018. Um, does anybody have a guess at what might have been the last, like, interesting paper in this space. I guess there are probably a lot, but maybe the, the biggest one. MapReduce, hmm. that was a long time ago. Maybe more recent than that. Flexible, Flexible Paxos, I haven't heard about this one. When was that? 
Okay. Bart, so these are all true and uh, interesting answers, but I was hoping somebody would tell me Raft. Raft is not Paxos, that's correct, yeah, that's true. Um, but for me, this was like the, 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 the other paper in this space that was like interesting. And um, when Raft came out, I was like very excited, I read it, I, I, like, I like learned about it. But I'm, after reading this, I think about when was, when was Raft actually released? And it turns out it was like um, 2013, which was like kind of a long time, if you think about it, like five years in this space, it's like, it's like quite a long time. What else happened in 2013, just to like contextualize? Does anybody even remember 2013? Like, if you if you go back and like the culture war, right? Like, so this 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 like video came out in 2000. It's like I barely remember this. Or like if you if you look in um like the Internet Meme Archive, like remember Doge Doji whatever? Like this the pictures were taken like a year or two before, but then uh, no, not the coin that came much 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 later, 2014 maybe. But no, like. <laughs> But this 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 like ancient meme was only uh, was only around in 2013, and then like for the technologists like remember Meteor.js? No, of course not. <laughs> Lol. Anyway, this is like a, a, a hundred million years ago. Uh, so I think the time is right for another like interesting uh, paper and maybe some novel ideas in this particular space since Raft. Um, Raft was like the, the hipster consensus protocol of its day, and I think it's it's long in the tooth now, and we're it's, we're due for a new one. So maybe this is it. Um, why do I? Uh, well, I don't love this paper yet because it's only been like five days, and I guess love takes longer to germinate. But I like this paper. Why do I like this paper? Uh, I think that it, whenever we have novel techniques for improving strong consensus, consensus that's always appreciated. Uh, Paxos still sucks. Um, it's really hard, and if you think you got it right, you're almost certainly wrong. Uh, there's there's a lot of subtleties that take a long time to get your head around. Uh, this paper is short, there are no Greek letters, and there's an implementation, which I really like because it seems like it was written for me, me being like a, a software engineer in industry, and I appreciate that. Um, and I think that's important, and I think that's important because there is this uh, sort of duality that I perceive between industry and academia often. Um, summarized, I think, in some part by this, a tweet that I found by uh, Joao, who was sitting in the corner and now is quite surprised to hear his name. Um, so uh, at Fastly, I guess we had this paper that was written um, and uh, submitted to SIGCOM and I guess rejected uh, because they could not see a specific connection to the CDN scenario. Uh, unfortunately, all authors of the paper worked at a CDN and apparently they swapped CDN for another buzzword and then got it accepted into another uh, conference. What I'm trying to convey by this is that the world of academia is weird and opaque and uh, as described here, uh, uh, a career in randomness if you're not like in it. And I think that this isn't really serving humanity. I think that academia and industry need to work a lot closer together and maybe like make conceits to each other to advance the state of art and technology. Um, so I love it when papers like make things easy for me. Similarly, I love coming to talks like this and demonstrating that I'm at least interested in academia somehow. So let's continue that. Okay, so here's the whole paper. Uh, 15 pages, plus some like proofs and stuff at the end. I don't really care about that. So let's go through it, um, kind of like page by page. And what I thought would be fun is I like I took pictures of the actual paper that I wrote on and stuff, so you can see kind of like how I read this as an industry person. Maybe that's interesting. Maybe it's stupid. Whatever. We'll see. Okay. So abstract and introduction. What we learn here is that Caspaxos is a extension of Synod and uh, like. What, it, what, what is Synod? I have no idea. We're going to find out together. Um, it's in the same family as Raft, uh, by which I mean it is a, it says here, um, a protocol that allows for a collection of nodes to work as a single state machine, which tolerates non-Byzantine failure. So this is a fun word. Uh, Byzantine. Does anybody, can anyone give a definition that will uh, resonate with the room? Anything goes. Anything goes. Interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. So the the name Byzantine, sorry? Yes, okay, so this is, like, I'm sure there's lots of good definitions, but I like this one. I like uh, Byzantine can be roughly uh, swapped with the word uh, mischievous or, like, uh, something like this, where uh, tolerating Byzantine failures mean tolerating bad actors in your network. 
tolerating non-Byzantine failures means everyone in the network is like not trying to cheat you somehow. So all these protocols can handle non-Byzantine, that is like non-malicious failures. Um, does anyone know what consensus protocols claim that they will tolerate Byzantine failures? Yes. Is Hashcraft like a, like a, like a blockchain thing? Yeah, okay. So like DLDR, all the blockchain protocols claim that they like solve the Byzantine uh, failure by boiling all the oceans with energy or whatever. Okay. So that's what we're doing. That's what we have here. Um, uh, so the introduction goes on to describe like a sort of motivation, like why do this? Why do this when we have multi-paxos or we have Raft, which claim to do the same thing? Well, they claim that there are a lot of indications that multi-paxos and Raft are complex. And if you read the Raft paper, you know, it's like its main claim to fame was like, uh, this is going to be a much easier thing to implement for people like me than Paxos or any of its variants. But as we learn uh, in the introduction, Jepson, which is this like um, testing program, found violations in almost every system tested based on either of these protocols. Uh, in addition, paper claims leader-based protocols have temporary availability problems. So both Raft and Paxos are leader-oriented protocols. We'll explain what that means in a bit. So anyway, the, it's like building this case of like why we should um, uh, why, why, we should, why we need a new protocol here. Um, goes on to say various authors of these previous papers uh, hypothesized that Paxos's complexity comes from the composition rules of multiple independent Synode instances. Am I pronouncing that right? Does anybody know? Synod. Okay. It's, it's, it's the name of like the collection of church elders that decides church doctrine. So I guess like synod probably makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, what this paper posits is that instead of using synod as a building block and sort of composing independent synod things into an overall uh, whole system, uh, instead uh, this paper extends that core like uh, conceit, that core bit of the protocol. So there is no composition and associated complexity. Okay. This makes uh, this protocol naturally and symmetrically peer to peer leading to optimal commit latency and uniform load balancing. Sounds really great. Okay. Uh, I drew this like based on here because I said that there is an implementation and we see here that it's in JavaScript and that kind of made me sad. <laughs> uh, okay, so these are the claims. Uh, it seems legit. Let's dig in. So uh, we go to the algorithm and here's like the meat of this talk. I'll try to explain it in a way that makes sense. And we're gonna learn at the same time what Synod is and then like what cast proxy, like how it's different. So the, the way it's arranged is actually like as a table of like steps and on one side Synod and on the other side uh, cast proxy, and you see that mostly it's almost identical. So Synod is um, an implementation of an initialize only once distributed register. That's a lot of words for a variable that can be set and never changed. And Synod ensures that when you do that in a distributed system, um, it uh, reliably gets a single value. So you can compose like a, a distributed key value store out of a lot of these things, uh, as long as all the data is immutable. So that's not so great. There's like conceits to fix that anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the protocol, all the actors in the system, all the nodes, have uh, one of three roles, client, proposer, acceptor. Okay, so we go down, and we see that uh, information goes through the system uh, in phases. There is a propose phase, whereby uh, a change is proposed, ACK, okay, and then there's like an accept phase, so it's like a two-phase kind of thing. Uh, proposals include a ballot number generated by the proposer, kind of like a vector clock, if you're familiar with that. So this is like an auto-incrementing thing. Uh, so let's get down into the, uh, the A and B. Step one, uh, the Synode client, which uh, if you conceptualize like a, a, a distributed data system, a client would be the thing connecting to the database and making requests. So very little uh, requirements on this thing, very, very, very little state. A Synode client sends the value that it wants to set. And here it's important to note that uh, we're always talking about a single register, a single variable. Um, in order to make this a useful system, we'd probably have to have lots of variables, like not only a single key and value, but like multiple keys and values. We're just focused on a single key value pair right now. And the key is kind of implicit, right? So just keep that in mind. So Synod is going to send the value in uh, as a value, but cast Paxos instead sends the value as a function, as something it calls a change function, which takes uh, a current value and then emits what the next value should be. And this is the core difference, I guess. Um, and I didn't really uh, understand what CAS meant until I got to this part of the paper, and I made this little note to myself. It's like, does F 
do some kind of validation of the current value, like check and set. Oh, right, that's what the name is for. Okay, I'm an idiot. Uh, yes, obviously. Uh, so that's what it is, right? It's like if you do an atomic compare and swap, that's what we're essentially implementing here. Okay, so that's step one. The client sends what it wants to do, and it's slightly different in both cases. Uh, the pr proposer is going to generate a ballot number, like a vector clock, uh, and sends prepare messages to all the acceptors, like a broadcast. Uh, the acceptors either return a conflict. Uh, that's no good. You're, you're, you're too late. This uh, ballot is too old. I already seen something newer. Um, or it's going to persist that ballot as a promise and return what it thinks the current value is, whether that's not anything yet or something it's seen previously. Okay. So far, this is exactly the same. Now, the proposer, when it gets all these things back, uh, it's going to wait for a quorum of responses that's like, 50 plus 50% 50 plus one, essentially, of all the uh, acceptors. And it's going to pick the value that is returned with the highest ballot number. So that's like the winning value of all the things that have already been seen. And uh, in the case of, of, of Synod, it's going to uh, set that value. So in the case where it's empty, it's going to set it. If in the case that it's already something, then it has to return it. But in the case of cast proxy, then it's going to apply the change function to that value. It's going to say, that's what it is currently. OK, we, I have that number or that, that value, I'm going to apply the function and get the next version of it. And then it's going to take that and broadcast it again. So it's like first prepare, do the thing, and then broadcast it again. Uh, the acceptors are going to get that message, return a conflict again, and then say in the same way if the ballot number is stale somehow and something else snuck in beforehand. Otherwise, they kill the promise that they recorded temporarily, they accept the new value, and they return OK. That's identical, and again, identical. Uh, the proposer is going to wait for a quorum of those responses and then return uh, OK or fail to the client. So I hope that this is pretty straightforward for me to explain. There's a lot of subtleties in the implementation, but it's like it made sense to me. Um, one thing that the paper now observes, which I think is quite neat, um, CASPAXOS can model the Synod like uh, semantics. And I, it can be an initialize only once a register if this is a change function, right? And the change function is like, if the value is not set, then set it. Otherwise, just return the value that currently exists, right? So this is equivalent to Synod, right? But since we have these extra semantics, we've expanded the definition from a value to a change function, we can implement uh, novel things like a compare and set register, which opens up like worlds of possibilities with uh, these three change functions, right? An initialize function that's kind of the same, except instead of just setting a value, you're uh, including a version vector along with it. There's an update function that is like reliably says, well, as long as this is a previous value, as long as your bank balance is, you know, $10, then subtract five from it, otherwise fail. And then like, I'll try again. And then a read function is just like this identity function. Yeah, and note that reads have to go through this whole process, otherwise you break causality. And if you want to know more about that, I'm not the guy to ask. You can ask uh, Kyle, Kyle Kingsbury. Um, there's a whole thing about changing membership in a cluster that is uh, often quite tricky to do, and this explains it's possible actually within the framework of what I've just described. Uh, once you make two observations, number one, quorums, that is like the, the, the number of people you need to get confirmations from in both of the phases can be flexible. You can change one and not the other and still make forward progress through the protocol. It doesn't break. Um, I put a star there because I haven't read that appendix yet and I can't really explain it more than that. So sorry about that, but it's there, I guess. Um, also, if we observe that a membership change can be orchestrated within the protocol itself. So from these two facts, there is a, uh, a, a process he describes on how to grow the cluster with new acceptors and also how to shrink the cluster. So it's the same thing, just reversed. Step one, turn the new acceptor on, okay, duh. Um, in the proposers, you expand the second phase pool to include it. You execute a no-op read to sort of like push a value through the system and increment all the counters. And then you expand the first phase pool. And through some magic of proof, um, this happens to be valid, right? It, it makes uh, everything linearizable. The same steps should be executed in reverse order to re reduce the size of the cluster. Okay, I trust that works. Um, implicit in all of this, though, is this, uh, I, uh, assumption that, well, this is a single uh, register, a single, a single value, but presumably we want uh, a single cluster of nodes for many values, right? So how do we do that? Like, we don't want to grow the cluster individually for each value in the database. Uh, there's no obvious hints for this from the example in the implementation, at least none that I could discern. So I guess that's like something I'll have to work out uh, myself. 
so I basically understand this, which is cool. I can't say the same from a, like a first read through of uh, Epaxos, for example. Um, in fact, I think in the Raft paper, they say uh, the, the authors of Raft, PhD students, didn't fully understand Paxos until they made several broken implementations to understand all the subtleties, and it took them a year. Uh, this took me, I guess, I understand it uh, in about, you know, like 20 or 30 minutes. So that's cool. That's really good. Okay, the paper goes on to describe uh, an implementation, a key value storage based on this protocol. Um, and the first thing it notes is that deletes are a little tricky. Um, just deleting something may accidentally leave stale data behind if like uh, a node is partitioned away and then comes back. And then that stale data subsequently may become authoritative. So it, it's like you delete something, and the delete appears to go through, but then a new node can like, an old node can come back in the cluster and suddenly your old data is there again. So there is a way to delete a value that um, involves this garbage collection step, which I think is really uh, uh, very funny actually. So deleting a value means writing an empty value and sketch uh, and like going through this process and then scheduling what it calls a garbage collection. Okay, what is a garbage collection? In the background, um, perform one of these no-op reads, right, to increment the, uh, the counter for the whole cluster uh, but set your quorum to be every acceptor, right? So just say, I need a response from everybody. And if that fails for any reason, just do it again. And it's like, okay, well, uh, sure, I guess that works. Uh, once you have that, and once you have everyone like agreed, literally every node agreed that this is the new state of things, then you can delete the value safely, right? But not until then. Um, so I guess that works. Uh, only it doesn't work, uh, it turns out. Uh, I, I put my name on this meetup, uh, and somehow the author like caught wind of it. And he DM'd me and he said, oh, it's cool. Uh, I noticed you're making a talk. That's really great. Um, I wanted to, oops, went too far. Where to go? Uh, I wanted to say uh, there is a flaw in the deletion procedure. I've just updated the article. It's not on archive yet. So here's the new deletion procedure. I guess you have to do something else. Uh, but that's cool. Like uh, academia, industry, you know, that's uh, neat. Meet up, making it happen. Okay. Uh, so then the paper goes on to talk about some of the properties of the system. Uh, in particular, it says, in theory, this protocol has low latency because it has to do only two round trips uh, and some more details. Uh, and it goes on to say, uh, OK, we tried it out in practice. This protocol has low latency. OK, great. Um, in fact, yeah, it's actually like quite impressive. It compares it against uh, Mongo and etcd and produces some pretty reasonable numbers. OK. Um, it also says about fault tolerance, because there's no leader, because it's like all peer to peer, uh, we have better um, fault. Uh, tolerance, because we don't ever become unavailable if the leader drops away. Yes. Yeah, so it's always like uh, two round trips, right, for any uh, verifiable check and set. Yeah, so they did a, a like a test setup, um, and they put nodes in these. Oh, God, what have I done? There we go. They put nodes in, in these um, data centers and then like predicted the and observed the maximum ping RTT and then said, well, um, setting values in aggregate should be should average out to this RTT times two. And indeed, that is what they observed with like a little bit of fluctuation. So it's a function of like physical distance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is maybe like a weird little bit about the particulars of the tests that they did. Uh, I think he writes here, um, it happened that the leaders of MongoD and etcd were in the Southeast Asia region. So to execute an operation in West US2 node, it needs additional round trip to forward requests there and back again. So that explains some of the discrepancy. If you ask me, he probably sort of set the leaders like in a sensical place explicitly and but whatever. Uh, all right, so yeah, so far so good. Um, okay, so this seems to like check out for the most part. Uh, in the last bit, comparison with related work, he claims Raft was born of the same need but didn't fix enough shit, basically it didn't go far enough. Okay, cool. Uh, Bizur, I've never heard of this, uh, it says it relates to cast proxy in the same way that Synode relates to cast proxy. Okay. Um, didn't really investigate that, haven't really had enough time. Epaxos is a leaderless variant of Multipaxos. But uh, so it like provides the same uh, ish feature set, so to speak, and the same um, guarantees, but it's significantly more complex. Uh, I got to take his word from that. I've never tried to implement that. Uh, okay. 
So open questions for me, at least, uh, as an implementer, right? Can acceptors also be proposers? Do they have to be on different nodes? I don't know. Probably there's some linearizable guarantee that needs to be satisfied here. Um, it turns out that serializing functions is a lot trickier than serializing values. If you have a language that like supports that, um, easy enough. Um, many don't, right? Or at least it's like trickier. Um, cluster membership changes are a bit subtle and not totally clear to me yet. I'm, I'm working through the implementation there. There's more there than meets the eye, I think. And there's lots of little implementation details, right? It's not fully spec'd, right? It's, there's lots of stuff you have to work through. But this is cool, I think. Um, the, the demo implementation was like 500 lines of node plus uh, it sits on top of uh, Redis, but not like clustered Redis, just like a single instance of Redis. I did a toy raft implementation back in uh, the heady days of 2013, and it was like huge. It was way bigger than 500 lines, definitely. And I got a lot of stuff wrong. Like it was not, it was not usable. Uh, so I started a Go implementation of this uh, yesterday. And it seems to be progressing along nicely enough, I guess. Time will tell. Uh, so in general, like papers I can implement, they, they make me happy. And so I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, so that's it. That's all I got. Uh, questions? You want to go that way? Questions? Okay. So Paxos has a safety proof, but not a liveness proof. Does this have either or both? That is a great question that I feel like I should be able to answer, but I cannot. <laughs> um, I believe that if you look at like the first page, it will describe the proofs that have been accomplished here. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Is there any disadvantage compared to Epaxos that they highlight? Uh, implementation complexity is the chief one. And I believe there is a slightly reduced feature set, but I couldn't tell you in what dimension. Yeah. Alex? Actually, like as a follow-up question to that question, do you know of a um, like uh, industrial epaxis implementation like that I can just use to play? Okay. Got it. Found any fun ways to break it yet? Have I found ways to break it yet? Uh, no, if I did, I think that would be another paper in itself since it has been formally verified for correctness at a minimum. Um, but we'll see because I'm, I'm building this on this sort of like distributed systems testing thing. It's like Jepson, but not Jepson. And um, I'll put it through the ringer. So we'll see, but I'm, I certainly hope not. I was curious what your specific application is. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't have one yet. But it's one of those things where I, um, I described it to a few of my colleagues and they're like, oh, that would be really cool if we could use it for this. I mean, let's be honest, like everyone thinks they see a cool thing and they're like, oh, that'd be really cool, you know? Um, for, I, I, I don't know if I really have a, an honest application, but it's fun to work through. Well, yeah. Yes, I can repeat. Right, so the question is like, are there minimum or maximum, I guess, bounds on the size of the cluster? Yeah, and what's the point, right? So a clients can be unlimited, proposers can be unlimited, they're generally stateless except for the transactional state of a single set. Uh, acceptors are stateful, um, and uh, it's specifically designed for wide area network deployments, right? So acceptors all over the globe, and minimizing round trip times in that context. So I don't know if what the upper limit is. I guess it would be on the order of, like the practical upper limit would be on the order of 10 nodes or something like this. Um, and so the question of why do it, well, like nodes crash all the time, right? So when a node crashes or dies or um, is partitioned away, you wanna be able to like put new nodes in to maintain your, um, your failure tolerances without uh, having to wait for that node to come back or um, wait for the disk to return or whatever like this. So like growing and shrinking the cluster is like an integral part of any sort of reliable distributed system, I suppose. Okay. We can talk after, yeah. So I'm curious, how does this compare to a spanner? And I'm a front end engineer, so I'm pretty far from back end, but from what I understand, Spanner kind of cheats by using atomic clock and the data centers around the world 
so you don't need like vector clock and stuff like that. So I'm wondering for performance reasons, does it even come closer to a spanner given that they have this like competitive advantage of using the time sort of precise around the data centers? Yeah, so spanner is this database, which if we go back to this sort of like spectrum analysis of the space, like it is fundamentally relational in that it, it exposes a relational um, query API to users, but it's implemented as a sort of dynamic system that oscillates between CP and AP, depending on um, the state of partitions, right? And there's another conceit um, rather than cap called pack elk, if you're deep in the um, in the in the industry in the jargon here, that uh, better describes this class of system. So um, Spanner is kind of a hybrid system, I would say, and it can dynamically switch its mode uh, depending on the environment. Um, it needs these atomic clocks to work because it has this like concept of a window. Um, I can't really say more to that, but there was an excellent talk on um, that particular aspect of Spanner uh, that was given at, uh, was it at GopherCon, the clocks one that the Kavya did? Or maybe it was Velocity, Strange Loop, right. Look up a talk uh, about clocks by Kavya uh, Joshi at Strange Loop, and she explains exactly how Spanner works, uh, or why the atomic clock is like important. It was like very, very intuitive. She did a very good job. Anyone else? Maybe this has to be the final question. I yeah. don't know. Okay. Yeah. You started to talk about uh, Byzantine failures, and someone said you said malicious, or someone said bad actors, but that's not necessarily what we see in real systems where machines fail in strange ways. They'll send corrupted data. Yeah. You know, we file or yeah. did flips. You know. So how, what do you think about these, these issues and how to solve them? Yeah, so it's like when you talk about a database that you deploy as a company, obviously this is true, right? You're not going to deploy code that is going to deliberately try to corrupt your thing unless you're a chaos engineer and maybe that's a different thing. Um, but what about data systems where you don't have control over what you deploy? Where anybody in theory can write code that claims to abide this protocol and join the network and start interacting with things. And so that is the situation where Byzantine failure becomes like uh, interesting, right? If you want to build a system that is like designed and deployed in that way, you have to be able to accommodate for these failures somehow, or these this class of failure, this class of maliciousness. Um, and I guess like Bitcoin is arguably like the 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 certainly the hottest, but like the most interesting at the moment uh, class of problem that is like this. Great. All right. Uh, there's more chairs in here. Like we're gonna do like a two minute break, and then I say two minutes. I may do one minute. It's gonna be. It's going to be okay. five. Two minutes. There's chairs in here. It'll be two. four minutes. Not two. Okay. okay. Two minutes. But give Peter another round of oh, applause. Round Thank of applause you. for Peter. Yay. Uh, everybody, this is Colton. Colton is co-founder and CEO of Kremlin. Previously, he was a chaos engineer at Netflix, improving streaming reliability and operating the edge services. Edge services. Check it out. Not, not the edge cloud. Not the edge cloud. The yeah. Edge. He designed and built FIT, Netflix Fault Injection Service. Prior, he improved the performance and reliability of the Amazon retail website. At both companies, he has served as a call leader, not cult leader, call leader. At, at Amazon, or at Netflix, they called it incident commander. Okay, fine. That's More exciting. exciting. Yeah, so you did that before it was trendy. Managing the resolution of company-wide incidents. Colton is passionate about building resilient systems, primarily as it lets him break things for fun and profit. To break away from chaos in his spare time, Colton follows a strict Mary Kondo minimalist lifestyle. So if you need advice about organizing your possessions by color, texture, or bliss level, he's your guy. Let's give it up for Colton. Thanks everybody. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about on designing and deploying internet scale services. It's written by James Hamilton. He used to be at Microsoft Research and part of Microsoft Live. He's now at AWS, Distinguished Engineer, VP, important person. Um, I got to bump into him in the elevator. I'm a big fan of, of James's. And I'm a big fan of this paper. I can say I love it because to me, this is like the ops Bible. Uh, when I was a young engineer at Amazon, I printed this paper out and I pinned it on the wall and I read through it. And what's funny as I was preparing this talk and going back through is how prescient it was. Like all of the advice and the details in it are things that we now are, have accepted or have become commonplace. But when I first read them, I was just 
blown away at, at how great they were. And uh, similar to similar to the previous speaker, what I love about this paper is it's very very legible. It's very easy to read. Um, you can pull it up on a web page. It's got bullet points. It's broken out. There's no complicated proofs. It was written by an engineer that ran production systems. And so while I'm not going to touch the academic versus industry uh, hot, a bit, hot bed of coals there, I've got an opinion. It's more like the skin in the game, Nicholas Nassim Taylor uh, opinion. But, um, but you can tell that James has, has felt these problems. He's felt this pain and he's run these systems. And so the advice that he gives is applicable. And that's something that I value in my career and that I love. So when he, he kind of opens by talking about what is the goal? You know, what is the point here? And it's to deliver operations friendly services quickly. Um, that quickly part is key. You know, how are we able to do this at scale and how are we able to do it while maintaining our velocity? And so there's some elements of that throughout that, uh, that I'll try to touch on that, that are ways that are, again, help you to build it quickly and to operate it well. And then he talks about avoiding early morning phone calls, but I always got woken up at two in the morning with a pager. So take, take, what you're, take the pain that you're trying to avoid and put it in there. But nonetheless, it's about building quality systems and making your customers happy. And I think that, that translates well across many dimensions. So he opens by talking a little bit about design. And uh, I think this is, this is an interesting one. He talks about how, you know, basically most operations issues originate in design and development. It's almost like we want our engineers to be thinking about these things while they're designing and building them, not just throwing it over the wall and being surprised later when things happen. Uh, since this kind of predated the DevOps trend a little bit, it's interesting that that is very much something that he advocates within the paper. So, so the number one thing he says is, is Look, we just have to design for failure. He talks about the scale at, that we're at, at internet scale services. When you're running tens of thousands of hosts, when you're running 20,000 disks, the failures that are random, the failures that occur seldomly begin to happen often. And as that scale increases, you begin to see these failures every day and more and more frequently. In the world where there's some combination of failures that could cause a problem, but the likelihood of them occurring feels very low, all of a sudden at scale, because these things are failing more often, we're seeing these unusual combinations of failures. And that can put us into some sticky spots where we need to be able to, to think about it. He talks a bit about redundancy, and I'm just gonna kind of throw this out there and leave it. Like, I feel like this is, you know, this is one of the bases of just building reliable systems. We need redundancy in place. We can't have single points of failure. We need to be thoughtful about multiple hosts. Um, some fun ones to pick on, the Dyn outage that happened last year, uh, a year and a half ago now. Um, you know, how many people suddenly decided it was super important to have a redundant DNS provider after that failure? Um, a lot of people. Uh, somebody remarked to me, and I hadn't thought of it beforehand, but I actually think that the other DNS providers were happy that that broke because they all got a lot more business. Now everyone needed two instead of one. So being thoughtful about that redundancy in our systems. And then fault recovery. What do we do to automatically remediate faults that occur? Are there things we can do like auto scaling groups where new hosts are added when they get knocked off or automatic remediation where processes that are getting killed or die can be restarted? Uh, again, I think this is kind of, this is good wisdom, but it's not necessarily groundbreaking. He talks a little bit about, again, in this thought of design that in the security world, we do threat modeling. We'll sit down and we'll whiteboard out a service and we'll look at the attack vectors and we'll think about what could go wrong. And from that, we have a, a set of things that we're worried about, a set of things we wanna prepare and harden our services again. Um, I, I absolutely agree with this because I have done this many, many times uh, at Netflix and Amazon and at Gremlin. Uh, every time we run a game day, which is, is like a, a planned, a thoughtful planned chaos experiment where we get a team together and we exercise failures like this. It begins with this kind of resilience modeling. Oftentimes I'll start with an engineer and I'll say, cool, whiteboard for me your service. Now tell me what could go wrong. And then I ask that question like four more times. It's like, well, do you have any internal services you rely on? Great. Do you have any external services you rely on? Great. Where are their network bound? Where are their 
fault tolerance libraries or circuit breakers? Where are you hitting your caching or persistence tier? And so if we spend the time to go through and really enumerate out the things that could go wrong, we can more adequately prepare, but additionally, we won't be surprised when they have occurred. And that doesn't catch everything, but again, I think the, the low hanging fruit, the 80-20 the, the, the is if we just sit down and we think about the things that could go wrong, and the earlier in the development process, the better, the better our software will be. Uh, I, I had this discussion today, I was, at, um, I was, at, I was giving a, a brown bag talk at lunch, and the discussion was with a security engineer. And we were talking about this exact thing, uh, about people that would come to him and they're like, hey, I'm launching this service in prod next week. Oh, it's an unauthenticated API that's publicly available. Uh, can you set up my DNS for me? <laughs> Whoa, no, 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 slow down. Like, there's all sorts of things wrong with that statement. And so similarly, when we're dealing with failure, the things that we think about up front in the way that we design our service and the way that we fit the pieces together can save us a lot of pain and heartache down the road. If we, if we try to bolt on resilience, like we try to bolt on security at the end, we're, we're in for a world of hurt. There will be some corners that we've been painted into that will be difficult to get away from. And then the KISS principle, you know, we just need to keep it simple. There's a lot of different moving parts. You know, I talk a, a bit about the microservice architectures and this combinatorial explosion of these death balls. If you've ever seen Netflix or Amazon's um, microservice graphs, which are all five, 10 years out of date now, they're, they're massive and they're just frightening in the complexity. No, no person can really foresee how all the ways in which they're going to interact or the ways in which they're going to fail. And so every place that we have to keep things as simple as we can while still being robust is critical. Next, he goes on to talk a little bit about failure isolation. And how do we separate things in a way so that when one thing goes wrong, it doesn't take down everything else? Um, he talks a bit about partitioning services. So, it, and what's interesting is, yes, we need to partition services, but not by company name or organization name or name prefix. Who, who can guess why that's a bad idea? Anyone wanna, wanna take a gander? Exactly. Yeah, your biggest customer is all in one shard and they fall over and they're completely unavailable and you're sad. Or you have hot spots in your application where, oh, there's no, oh, the Z cluster is super quiet. Wonder what's going on there, but that A cluster is getting pounded. Um, so being thoughtful about how we partition in a way that keeps things safely distributed and allows us to share that load or balance that load. And he talks about these, this idea of having lookup tables so that more than just the partition itself, we can find other ways to balance traffic. And I think what's a little bit implicit in this as well, well, not implicit, yeah, is the, the ability to do adjustments. So the ability to do it dynamically. So having a little bit of control there so that we can choose the traffic amongst partitions and so that we can have better control over those issues. He talks about isolating our clusters. So I think different than like, our data stores are our partitions, they're the, you know, our microservices, our applications. And we don't want, you know, four services all running on the same cluster. That's part of the reason we've moved to microservices. They give us this natural isolation and allow us to have separation of concerns. This is important when it comes to resource constraints. It's important when it comes to logical bugs. It's important when it comes to things failing over and cascading across the rest of the service. And, you know, he kind of generically says, look, and this applies all the way down. We want to be thoughtful about how we're isolating things. Load shedding and, and performance is an interesting one. I've kind of grouped them together, but they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, the first one being, you know, we need to understand how our services behave. We need to understand their performance characteristics. We need to know what throughput looks like. And one of the underlying themes that he talks about several times is being able to keep data and historic data so that we can look at what we expect to behave. I'm sure, again, this is probably second knowledge or, or common knowledge to all of us now. We have week over week graphs and predictions that help us to understand if traffic's deviating. But again, it's important that we, we keep that historical information and we can benchmark against it or we can go back and compare against it. The other thing he talks about when, when dealing with this kind of throughput and understanding is, um, is understanding the latency, is understanding the different latency distributions. And I'll tell you, if you, if you don't 
well understand the, the percentiles, the 10th percentile, the 90th, the 99th. If you haven't gone through and dealt with the kind of gray failures that latency can introduce, it's a good, it's, it's a good topic to study up on. Um, being able to read your metrics graphs and being able to really understand when things go wrong, how they're degrading and how they're behaving are critical. And he talks a bit about, you know, what's essentially protecting yourself well. If you reach a point where the system's under duress and things are starting to go sideways, instead of just continuing to accept work and drowning under the load, you need to, you need to shed traffic. You need to push back. You need to be careful about this. I've definitely seen this on both sides of the equation. When you're a service, you want to make sure that when you're in trouble, you start fast failing and, and preventing new work from coming in so that the old work can complete. When you're a client, you want to be a good citizen. This goes back to some of the, the basic principles of the internet. Be, be very prescriptive about what you send, but be very uh, accepting about what you receive. And so as a client, we want to, we want to back off. We want to when we want to do exponential back off, we want to be thoughtful about the requests and how long we're willing to wait. And so, again, just good, good wisdom there. Make sure that you protect yourself and your service so that when things go wrong, you're covered. And then have control points at major boundaries. Um, in my experience, I've often seen these at the proxy tiers. So there's a nice natural ingress if you have a proxy that sits in front of your API or another key service. And that's a point where you have control and you can choose to stop traffic from coming in or starting to wean it or starting to have that insight. It's also super important for being able to measure it, to be able to see how it's behaving. Yeah, it's also a good point to run different experiments and tests. Um, there's obviously a lot of value in having that proxy as a control point. Um, another underlying thing that J theme that James talks about are having these um, these places where a person can get involved if things go wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, his sections on automation, but at the end of the day, our systems are run by people and for people. And so sometimes an operator has to get involved and has to take care of things. And these natural control points are good places for someone to step in and both understand how the system's behaving and possibly take a mitigation action if the system's unable to do it on its own. And then when you're deploying a service, when you're deploying a new feature, when you're, when you're going out and you're rolling out things, meter the traffic and the ramp up and watch it carefully. You don't just go dump 100% of load on the new system. You be thoughtful about how you introduce it. And there's a very dynamic, iterative approach that you see throughout this paper where you, know, you wanna try a little bit and see how it behaves. And then you wanna continue on and add a little bit more. Um, he talks a bit about timeouts and when you're configuring timeouts, he says, instead of, you know, trying to find the perfect timeout for every situation, pick something that's good enough, get it out there, watch how it behaves, watch the data, watch the week over week or the day over day, watch it as you ramp up and meter out the traffic and then adjust it and tweak it until you arrive at the right value. And then he talks about having this, this big red switch to just turn off non-essential traffic. If things are really buried, if things are going wrong, you can just click this button and shed a bunch of load or work from the system so that hopefully the rest of the system is able to repair. Um, it's funny, I didn't realize this, but in retrospect, this was a big effort at Netflix while I was there for a while. It was called Blue Mode. I don't know why it was blue. Um, but it was essentially, let's, let's find out what the set of tier one critical dependencies are. And if we're ever really underwater, let's just fail all traffic to everything that's not tier one. Let's just fast fail it, let's black hole, let's, let's not even make those requests. And to be honest, I haven't seen this done in production in a way that I can talk about. I'd love to hear if anyone has stories on this, on this front. I think it was a great idea and it, it actually led us to have a better way of programmatically defining critical services and, and understanding how to interact with them. But I've never seen this, this particular approach save me in an incident or, or when things have gone awry. So dependencies. Dependencies are the devil. Um, no, we all need dependencies. We all have internet, inter interconnected systems. They're all super important. The first one is expect latency. You know, performance characteristics are going to change. And so if you are relying on a dependency, whether it's internal or external, whether it's Amazon or Azure or, you know, the identity service that the team next to you wrote, you have to be thoughtful that at some time that could slow down or at some time that could fail. 
And I think you know, part of what he goes into here is about the gray failures. It's sometimes difficult to detect you know, the slow boil problem or little bits of latency where things have gotten bad, but not bad enough to be completely broken. And in fact, in the terms of, uh, in the terms of chaos engineering, I, I always advocate first fast failing and then testing like a latent or a, a gray failure because the fast failure is usually a little bit more simple and straightforward. You see whether you handle an exception well, you see whether you handle a null well, you get a better sense of if your service handles that, if, if that whole service falls over. But when things get slow, you know, that's where you're testing that your timeouts are configured well, that your thread pools are configured well. You're testing that you are protecting yourself. Hey, Docker, not a good time. So we have to prepare for latency. Um, this is the one that, that I, that I loved the zero trust of underlying components. You know, I think the, the first level of maturity is that, you know, we expect our services to handle well, but we kind of expect everyone else's services to do the right thing. Uh, the second level of maturity there is that you don't trust anything you depend upon. Uh, I have some code that calls S3. I know what happens if S3 fails because I don't trust S3. One day it will fail again. You know, similarly with other things, you need to have a pessimistic view. Your customers don't really care if the failure that occurred was your fault or one of your dependencies fault. It manifests to them in the same way. And so it's critical that you're, you take that pessimistic approach and you prepare for it. And then he goes on to talk about how dependent services really need to have the same or higher SLA of the service that depends upon them. Now, this is an interesting one that I might not agree 100 percent on. Um, I think there's plenty of categories where you can have like a tier two or a less critical service that can have some sort of graceful degradation, some kind of canned fallback or cache data that can be served in the case of a failure. But I guess in a way that just helps keep that SLA higher. So maybe that maybe that's not uh, in comp in uh, conflict with what he's stating here. But again, it, it's thoughtful. You know, if you if you think about availability, there's always the fun math of I want to write a four nine service. I rely on ten services. They all have what you know. What availability do those ten services have to have so that I can hit four nines? Well, it's better than four nines for all of them because you could get a combination of failures, or they can fail at different times. And so you often want your dependencies to be more resilient. Again, though, we don't trust them. So I have to figure that out. He goes on to talk a little bit about releasing and testing. Um, you know, he doesn't call it continuous integration and continuous deployment, but he says you should be shipping often. You should be pushing your code. He talks about doing regular testing, you know, the kinds of things first that should be done in your unit test to make sure that you've got sanity and so that you're testing that there's not any logical flaws or any ways in which your code um, corrupts data. But then he talks about, you know, and then he goes on to talk about, okay, well, we wanna do canaries. We don't wanna push out a brand new version to the entire world at once. The risk of that failing or that risk if there's a bug or an unknown scaling constraint is really bad. So again, this might just be conventional wisdom with, with how we do things today, but first canary and then do a stage deployment. Um, this is a fun one that I've seen burn us a couple of ways. We've, we did pretty good at this at Netflix where we had three regions and we'd push out one region, make sure it was good and then push out the next and the next. But then we had uh, data platform tools that would update the catalog across the world all at once. And so this isn't always just a deployment problem. It's a way in which you push out changes to the world. And if you're thoughtful about that, then if things go wrong, you wanna catch it in a single region, isolate that failure, and be able to test it before it breaks everybody. And he talks about pushing code during the day, you know, when people are around. Um, I'm a big believer in this too. If you're pushing code at two in the morning, don't be surprised when you get paged if something goes wrong and no one's watching it. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier when there are many eyes around the office keeping an eye on how things are behaving. You've got support or customer service keeping an eye on things. Just tends to make your life. It's just, it's not, it's not a must have, but it certainly makes your life nicer. And then he talks a bit about how the, the failure recovery, so the mitigation, whatever we're going to use to save us when failure occurs, has to be simple and it has to be tested frequently. And this absolutely resonates well with me. Um, so I, one of the stories I like to share about, uh, about good chaos engineering, good testing, is the region evacuation. Uh, 2013, Amazon US East 1 went down for a day. Netflix went down for a day. Not real good for business. Doesn't make your customers real happy. 
And so it became real important to have multi-regions and to have a plan if that ever occurred again. Now, what's interesting is, you know, this process evolved and iterated over time. In the beginning, it was very manual. It took hours. There were lots of people involved. In the end, it was a five to 10 minute automated process, but it's run every two weeks at Netflix. And the reason that's important is every other run or so, there's some new bug or failure that's found, a new service that has a scaling dependency that when the new traffic hits, causes trouble, new, new bugs or issues in the proxy code or the way that that traffic is being pushed around. And the nice thing is if it's regularly tested, then it'll work when it's called upon. It'll work when you need it to. Um, and this is actually something that happened to me. Uh, I was on call in 2015, right before I left Netflix, and we had a Saturday or a Sunday morning where EC2 in US East 1 stopped giving out new hosts. Well, Saturday, Sunday morning at Netflix, it's kind of like Saturday morning cartoons, like people hop on and, and traffic scales up quickly. And so if you're unable to get new instances, you won't be able to handle the load that's coming. But because this was a well-tuned process that was automated, well, mostly automated and mostly muscle memory, we were able to, on chat, start the failover, get the process kicked off. I think we avoided having a, a sub one call for this incident at all. And then, you know, by the time by the time traffic had ramped up, we were in the new region, we were stable, we were running code, and we were reading on the internet about everyone complaining about Amazon being down and and have problems in US East One. James actually has like four different quotes on why you should test in production and why you have to do this failure testing. I deleted three of my slides because I didn't want to just feel like I was hammering this point home, uh, and I kept my favorite one. Um, we, we have to make sure, we, first of all, we have to test in prod. Prod's the environment that matters. That's the environment where we make our money. That's the environment our customers depend upon. And so if we're not doing the testing in production, we're missing the most important environment. And further, it shows that there's a bit of a lack of maturity and confidence. It tells us that we don't really know what's going to happen, and that uncertainty keeps us from going and exercising those failures. The flip side is, is if we are regularly exercising, I mean, we can start and dev or test and work our way up, but we need to be running them in prod because that's really what builds that confidence. And again, I felt that. I've gone into you know holiday peak where the first year I was there, I was worried. We were getting paged a lot. Things were breaking. I had no confidence that I was going to make it through the holiday break without being on a call. And sure enough, I was on three. Uh, the next year, we'd done a lot of proactive failure testing to ensure that we could handle the kind of failures that often occurred. And we had a very calm and quiet holiday uh, experience. But importantly, we, we had confidence going into it that our system would behave well. When our VP came to us and said, are you ready for holiday peak? The first year we're like, well, we're going to try. And the next year we're like, yes, we're ready. And then the point about production, about the recovery working, I think that's, again, very much that point about region evacuation. You, you don't want to be on a incident where things are broken and then try to make, try to apply a mitigation, try to apply something to make it better and actually introduce a second complete failure mode where now you're not in the failure mode A or failure mode B, you're in failure mode C, which is two different failures. And you have to disentangle those and fix them both at the same time. And I think there's nothing worse than that expectation that you have a safety net to find out your safety net has a big old hole in it. You fell right into the ground. So test, 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 test. Automation. Um, talks about being, about making, again, making your automation simple and clear. Like there needs to be places that you can understand it and then places that you can drop into the process and take action. If things are going wrong, and so auto scaling is an example of this. I've been on a I've been on a call where auto scaling went haywire, and our services went from a couple hundred to a few thousand. Uh, I've hit the point where the AP the AWS API started throttling us while just continuing to throw hosts at us. Uh, all the while the service is under load and not recovering. And that's the kind of place where if you have a checkpoint where you can say disable this or stop doing this automation until we have things in line you can have that ability to interact with the system. It's these feedback loops when things start going awry that, that feed on each other that can just go out of control. And so sometimes you just need to be able to say, stop, don't, don't do anything more for a minute. I know you're trying to help, just stop for a minute. Let, let me figure it out. He talks about code and configuration being as one. Um, this is an interesting one because I didn't, 
didn't see enough examples in this to really, you know, I, I think I know in spirit what he's talking about here, but I don't have a good concrete example of how we, you know, of, of this principle in action. So we want to keep our code and configuration together. I know we don't want them to be out of date. We don't want to drip them. Um, there was a there was a tweet that went through my stream today. It was by Lauren, who's at Netflix, who was talking about uh, pushing configuration can actually be more dangerous than pushing code. We have processes and thought around how we push code and discipline, pipelines, tests, etc. Uh, I have definitely been part of outages where somebody went in and changed a global property and everything fell to the ground. By the way, if everything falls to the ground at once, uh, oh, I'll, we'll talk about that. You got to have a way to to see what's happening, um, to see what's changed. He also talks about auditing configuration to ensure accuracy. You know, I think this is things like we have, sometimes we have it checked into source control. Sometimes this configuration lives in a dynamic place, but are we, are we doing sanity checks on it? Um, one, one example of this from, from Netflix, we would go through and we would compare like our, our properties and configuration between different regions. And if all you did was throw all three of them in a spreadsheet and look at the values, pretty quickly you could tell that, that there were things in there that were absolutely configured wrong. So that's the type of thing where we can do some gut checks. It may not give us the answer and we may still have to do some work, but it can hint at us that something's awry in the system or not behaving the way we, or might not behave the way we expect when things go wrong. And then operations, uh, you know, there's so much there's so much goodness in the operations section that I've only picked out a few points and it being an easy to read paper I'll I'll leave you to go skim through for more of the details but you know again kind of a, a head of the devops movement uh, align incentives and align pain like your engineers and the development team need to have skin in the game they need to they're the ones who you know if they feel the pain they're the ones who have an incentive to fix it they're the ones that, whether they introduced it or whether they missed it the first time, are ultimately responsible for some of the bugs or issues that occur. And they're the ones that can go fix it. They're the ones that can go improve it in advance. And so separate from the kind of old school approach of we'll throw this over the wall and wonder why things break, we want to make sure that we, we keep, keep the right people involved in the loop. Uh, one change at a time. So this was one of the, the rules of Amazon incident management was if we had a large scale incident, you know, there's a lot of smart people on the call. They have lots of ideas about how to fix things. If you have four people all go off and implement their idea of how to fix something at once, uh, you, can, you can arrive at a few interesting scenarios. One of which is, hey, it, went, it got better. It went away. What did we do? Uh, we're not sure. We did a few things. Uh, it could have been this. It could have been that. Uh, the other thing is, what if you make things much worse? Um, which change do you revert if you made things worse? Um, there, there's this, this causes you to be a little slower and a little bit more methodical. So I think there is, like anything, a time and a place to apply a little risk assessment. Sometimes you do want to, if you feel like the change might be low impact or, or fairly isolated, then sometimes you might want to do these things not in parallel, but cl in close succession. Um, but you really want to be thoughtful about it. And in general, you want to just be having one change to the system at a time so you can really understand the outcome of that. And then as I mentioned before, you know, oh, I pushed a global fast property and everything melted. Well, at both Amazon and Netflix, we had tools where we could see the audit history of all the changes made, whether it was in configuration or service deployment or other actions that engineers took. And frankly, uh, my, my ops cheat sheet, cheat sheet is to just go look at that right away. Uh, I, on so many incidents, I would just pull that up. Cool, what did it start? 8.33, only three things happened at that time. The hell were those? And you dig into them and like, you know, not every time, but oftentimes you could quickly see, oh, well, this, this change looks suspicious. Let's get that person on the call and let's ask him what, what was happening or what the goal was here. Um, and he talks about this theme in more than one place. We want to capture a lot of information. We want to be able to audit it. Um, we want to be able to really understand how the system behaves. And again, there's so much here that I, I kind of wanted to just summarize it. Um, keeping a customer-centric view. Uh, at the end of the day, it's whether our customers are happy with our systems that we get paychecks for and our businesses continue to survive. And so, you know, we have the customer facing metrics at Amazon and Netflix, orders per minute or stream starts per second. 
And those were always our holy grail. If those were ever broken, that's when a big incident started. And that's when everyone jumped on a call to figure it out. But being thoughtful about not just, oh, this API's you know, P95 latency, but what the actual business impact of the metrics and the customer's usage of the product. Instrument everything. I mean, easier said than done, but that's a nice one. The more data you have, the more insight you can have, both at the time and historically. Uh, this is another of the reoccurring themes. If you can go back and look at last week's data, if you can go back and look at the last version's uh, performance characteristics, if you can go look at the last deployment and understand how it behaved, all of those things can be contextual to, uh, clues to help us understand what's going wrong today. Data is super important, latency is hard, historical data is good. The one that I think is, is probably a little bit more unique and one that I haven't seen tracked well is tracking the automated actions that you take within the system. Um, again, I've been on uh, auto scaling, just seems like a, a natural, easy one here. If you go and look at the auto scaling history, sometimes that tells an interesting story that, you know, from the outside, it just looks like I've got a cluster of N hosts and they're fine. But really, oh, every two minutes, we're cycling through one of those hosts. Why is that happening? What's going on? And so if you're rebooting, you know, if it's a client metric, if you're backing off exponentially, are you tracking that somewhere? Are you able to notice that, hey, during 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., all, all the calls to this service start failing and then having to retry over and over again? And those can be both helpful for diagnostic and historical purposes, but also for digging in and looking for things that could go wrong down the road. So there's my quick summary. Uh, I wanted to do some Q&A, and uh, so I'm happy to take any questions or uh, comments uh, or similar war stories, whatever whatever the rooms thinks a good use of time is. Ideally, questions. OK, questions. Right. You, probably bad speaker etiquette to say, hey, could you hop up here and tell me a war story for five minutes? Because someone no, will do it. No, the war story is fine. I just meant, like, questions are better than well actually. OK. Ah, the question. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned uh, like zero tolerance, zero trust for underlying components. How far are you willing to go? Because like it's okay like to like check for service being unavailable. Another thing, not to trust your TCP stack implementation. Where do you draw the line? I mean, with anything, I think there's an 80-20. You know, where where you want to apply the reasonable uh, approach. One of the things he talks about use use known good builds of dependency. And so that you've got confidence that that dependency is going to work the way you want. You know, yeah, we probably we probably trust that in general TCP works correctly. I think it really comes down to uh, code that's in our control or code that is being changed and, and iterated on frequently. So that's the, the identity service that I depend upon. If they're pushing often, you know, I'm going to be thoughtful that, you know, it, it might behave a little different than I've got this service over here. We push it once a year. It doesn't really change. Usually that, that I mean, again, no, nothing's absolute, but it's usually uh, a bit safer in that way. Hi. Uh, it seems like most of the points were points of process, which to me feel kind of like table stakes these days, which I guess is testament to the like staying power of the paper. I was surprised to see very few points of like system properties. For example, observability is something that everyone's talking about now. And I'm curious, like your reaction to that, like um, maybe did you feel it was underserved in the paper or maybe the tools weren't advanced back then or what? I mean, he definitely talks a lot about what, what we consider observability, how we analyze logs, how we're able to dig in and diagnose things. Like you'll find a lot of that in here. I left some of that out because I think it's been talked about a lot recently. I mean, again, I think for a paper that's 10, 12 years old, uh, you know, when I first started developing software, when I was doing software at that time, a lot of these things weren't common knowledge. They weren't table stakes. And so in a way, that, that's why I call it the ops Bible. You know, it's like there's so much good wisdom and process in here that you can just apply. But it, it, it might be obvious if you've been operating systems for 10 years or, or on calls all the time. It might be pain you felt and things you figured out. I was wondering if you read the Google SRE book. Yep. And I was... So that's pretty much a superset of this like 10 years later. So I was wondering if there is, you found something that disagreed on the, where well, the paper and the book disagree of, on or has changed over the last 10 years. Uh, I could probably tell you what I disagree with the SRE book on, but I don't know if I can contrast the paper and the book on the fly. Uh, I think that, again, this, this paper is really, yeah, no, I'm going to leave that as my answer. It's safer. It seems smarter. 
get me afterwards and I'll give you my, I'll give you, I'll tell you how I really feel. <laughs> uh, so question I had, uh, I mean, paper, I agree with everything said, but I wondered if it brought up any of like the meta questions of, you know, this is, sounds great for engineers, but engineers have to build products and you have, you have like the quest, uh, the pressure of like product managers and people telling you what to do. How do you optimize for what needs to be? Oh man. So he talks about that right at the top. Um, I thought I had a bit on that, but I, I might have removed it. But essentially, he says, look, like this is, this is important. Like this is, this is arguably more important than some of your product features, but it's something that needs to be thoughtfully invested in, and it's things that need to be spent time on. One of my personal pet peeves, I feel like availability nowadays, it's like, it's like buying meat from the butcher. It's just like outages are, are, meat, are, are meat on the bone. Like you're, you're paying for something that, it's just not as important for, for a lot of organizations. They just expect your services to be up and available and they're surprised when they're not. And the truth is uh, a very stable, boring system takes a lot of hard work to get there. A boom, 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 firefighter, everything's on fire. I can swoop in and be the hero. I've done that. I've been the hero when everything's on fire, but those systems are easy because you don't put the time and effort into it. And so whenever I'm speaking to companies or customers or people, I'm always advocating that engineers talk to executives in terms of money. Outages have a very real cost, uh, millions of dollars. The, the metrics that are, I think are fairly outdated are 300 grand an hour. Um, there's plenty of examples. The Amazon S3 outage cost everyone other than Amazon, $150 million. We had the British Airways and the Delta outages this past year, 100 to $150 million in impact. It's estimated that it's $700 billion in the US lost to outages. But most companies are just expect you to write performant, resilient software, but aren't willing to dedicate the time and effort to prepare for it. Um, another one of my pet peeves is, is this, this opportunity to do fire drills, to do preparation and practice. Um, the on-call training of most companies I've been at is here's your pager, good luck. There's a run book. I don't know if we've updated it recently. And you get that on the job training when things break. You know, you imagine a world where you're running these experiments, you're doing this testing proactively and your on-call has an opportunity to, to get paged and make sure that that's set up correctly, to look through the dashboard and ask questions about what the hell it's measuring and how it moves and validating the process. And I think, I think that uh, the irony is we would save more time if we did it that way. We could budget for it, we would plan for it, and we could put two hours in up front instead of the 20 hours that happens. Because every outage is, is not just the time it takes to get on a call and mitigate it. It's all the time it takes to deep dive and analyze it, to have the COE or incident review, to go fix all the action items, and then make sure that, you've, that they don't occur again. So I was too long. Did I? Oh, I'll, I'll get to your question if you want. Uh, wow. Uh, don't don't mess with Inez. Um, you might get smacked with the mic. Go ahead. Uh, so, what's the best way to learn how to reason about uh, internet scale services short of working for a while with a company that's directly responsible for them? Yeah, you had to add that caveat, huh? I was going to say join every uh, Sev one. Uh, call at Netflix and Amazon. That's that's how I learned. When I joined Amazon, uh, I actually went through every uh, old incident that had occurred and read about it. Now, it's a shame that people aren't very good about sharing those. It's, it's a bit of a shame. And so no one's in a position where they want to tell you about all the dirty secrets. Things have gotten better. You're starting to see some of these outage reports. Uh, SRE Weekly or DevOps Weekly has a mailing list that, that lists all the outages with links to them, and you can go read the postmortems. Um, but in my opinion, it's always by doing, it, building and operating, whether it's small scale or large scale, feeling the pain and reading real world experiences is, is how I advocate preparing. Right. No more questions? Ah, one more. Have you in practice uh, found any of these to be particularly hard to implement? The one thing he says, and this is one of those four things I deleted, is um, you have to find it real quick. Talks about, you know, like for this to be successful, you have to write the code and you have to be willing to run it in production. And like if you have mitigations or scripts, that's a good idea, but then you're unwilling to go through and regularly test them or actually run them in production, then you're not, 
you're not really ready to do this. And so I think there's that a little bit of that theoretical world where people are like, cool, I'm going to do region failover, or I'm going to do this script that will automatically handle this kind of failure that occurs. And it's theoretical, and then it's in prod, and people know about it, and they're like, hey, should we use this? And we're like, well, I don't know. Is that going to make things better or worse? Um, I think those are, are some of the difficulties I've seen. I, I, just two things. Um, when you were talking about the, the reliability of the underlying services, um, I used to deal with uh, network equipment, and we always used to sort of describe sort of the, the risk associated with any particular action in packet miles. Hmm. Um, we always used to talk about like, you know, how many packets have gone how far using these particular types of things. And so when you talk about things like TCP, that's solid. Yeah. Um, and it's all sort of, and so, I mean, I, I think you really have to kind of look at the maturity mm -hmm. of all these different sorts of things to kind of really um, accurately sort of assess what the, the real risk is. Um, the other thing that I sort of take a little bit of umbrage with is always deploy during business hours. I think that it's like, um, it's like, is Black Friday business hours? Would you deploy code changes on Black Friday? And most people would say no. And, be, and so I think one of the things that I think is really important to understand is that there's, you, you always need to sort of mitigate the risk associated with any particular change against the particular outcome and how it affects your customers and your revenue stream. Because, you know, that, that sort of, oh, it's daytime. It's like, it's great. Everybody's here. And it's like, you know what, you, sh you should have taken a fucking nap and done it at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, and I, I mostly agree with you. And I think, you know, when you're dealing with global services where you're going to deploy to three regions and it's impossible for to hit, you know, that customer's nighttime, because early in, in the early days, you're like, cool, let's just push while no one's on and then we don't have to worry about it. But I think the wisdom is that's less about the potential impact to customers because at global scale, you don't get that. And it's more about having your team available, prepared and thinking about it, because if it's, it's happening off off hours and you know, I'm having a beer and I'm just kind of watching some deploy and it goes off and then things go wrong. We've got to get everyone involved. We've got to get a call spun up. But but again, I think with all things, good judgment, and risk assessment is, is key. Go ahead. So one other question I had was that you will say that you should test all your config. Which I agree with, but I have never, I don't quite know how the best way you would do that. I None of the companies I've worked for have had a good way of doing it, just kind of um yeah yeah he kind of advocates this this uh auditing and this analysis against other configuration as an approach there um you know and it's it's how you test that configuration so one of the things i've i've learned in doing failure experiments it's it's like again at the small scale you might test if you're handling if it logically occurs you know if you have a good fallback if you have a good null handling but at large scale you're testing like are my timeouts set correctly? Are my thread pools set correctly? Am I properly throttling? And I think those are the configuration values that you test. But again, we write, we write our systems and we set those values, those alerts and those thresholds in like the happy case when everything's working well and not, not in the case where it needs to protect us, which is when everything's melting down. And so that's where we have to put ourselves in positions where we actually test that configuration. 10 second timeout means nothing without context. All right, last question. Hi. As you uh, very accurately explained, it, this is an old paper, but, but this is straight fitting into what actually need to build the application uh, into the large scale. But over the period of the time, there are multiple things which have been introduced because just like uh, being a, building a large scale application generate large data, which need a, a big analytic system. Mm -hmm. You need a predictive uh, failure analysis. You need uh, auto remediation. Which you know, which this paper doesn't talk about. Are you planning to include all these things, uh, like moving forward, or what's your plan on that? Uh, I mean, we can ask James. He's building that all into AWS. As I'm going to guess the answer. Certainly, this is not meant to be a, a comprehensive inclusion of everything that can happen. And certainly, there's a lot of things we've learned and, and a lot of ground we've made in the last eight to 10, 12 years. You know, I think Peter said this well. It's like five years in computer science times is like 
a hundred years. So definitely there's a lot more that comes, but, but I guess I'd reiterate that I'm surprised that the test of time that the majority of this paper has, and in part probably because it's more processes than technical advice, how to tune, tune how to tune your timeouts correctly. That article may or may not work well for 10 years, but being thoughtful about how you come about that process and the approach might. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.